And uh, before we begin our look at Psalm 92, why don't we join one another in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together in the fellowship of believers. And you are the one who has called us. You loved us first, so we now love you. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you've called us together into this little church body. And we're grateful for our brothers and sisters. We ask that you would help us to be loving towards one another as you have been loving towards us, that you would help us to be encouraged by our time together tonight and have our cups filled by you and by each other. Bless our time together and study, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 92. This is going to be a praise psalm. Psalm 92 is a praise psalm. This is going to be praising God's salvation. It's going to be praising God's... Uh, I'm sorry. What's that? You are not. What did he say? And why do you always listen to me? Oh, I know. Did you listen to I asked down? her about her hair. Yeah. Oh. 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 They're right here. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I was late. We hadn't started. We we just started, and you guys still managed to okay. mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Quit speaking in tongues. We're cessationists here. You don't. You don't need to speak in Italian tongues. <laughs> so this is going to be a, a praise psalm that talks about God in the in the sense of Creator and in the sense of uh, Savior, um, His salvation and His creation, uh, His greatness of His works and those works being the work of creation and the work of salvation. So, with that in mind, this is not a very long psalm whatsoever. So let's see what we can learn from it. This says in the subtitle, How Great Are Your Works, meaning God's works, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath. So there you go, context already. This is about, the title of the song is How Great Are Your Works. So there you go, you know it's a praise psalm, a praise song for God. And not only that, it says it's a song for the what? For the Sabbath. So you would have songs that would be sung throughout the week, and then you would have songs that would be sung specifically on the Sabbath. This is one of those songs specifically set aside to be sung during Sabbath worship. And we can get into that a little bit more at the end, but let's just read through this and we'll answer our questions starting in verse 1, which is a good place to start. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the work of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know, the fool cannot understand this, that though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age, and they are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Amen. Amen. Question one. According to verses one through four, when should God be praised and why? Let's just take it verse by verse. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Verse 2 says to declare your what? Steadfast love or loyal love when? In the morning. In the morning. All day long. Yeah, and your faithfulness by night. And Bob's got it right. It's morning to night. So when should, we, when should God be praised? Morning, night, all the time. That's the whole point. It's just a poetic way of saying God should be worshipped and praised all the time. We should always be giving thanks. 
Let's keep reading verse 3. To the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre, for you, O Lord, have what? Made me glad glad by what? Your works. Yeah, and it's by the works of God's hands that the psalmist sings for joy. So more reason as to, so we answered when God should be praised, and that was more to the answer of why. Because his steadfast love, loyal love, faithfulness, and also because of the works of his hands. Everything that he's done, those are all good reasons to sing for joy. And that God is most high. That there's no one else above him. That he is the most high. So he is the, he is the tippy top. There's no one above him. You can't, you can't go end around God. He is the most high. He is faithful and he is steadfast. And all his works are make us who put our faith and trust in him glad and full of joy. Question two. How does God's thoughts differ to the thoughts of the world in verses 5 and 6? Let's just read verses 5 and 6. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. deep. Compared to, verse 6, the stupid man cannot know. The fool cannot understand this. So how does God's, and we'll get to verses 7 through 9 in a second, but just through verses 5 and 6 there, how do God's thoughts differ to those in the world? God's thoughts are deep. Man's thoughts or worldly man's thoughts are stupid, stupid, (laughs) foolish, lacking understanding, right? Lord, your thoughts are very deep, but the stupid worldly man cannot know and the fool cannot understand this. And this is the second part of question two. What What is it that the fool does not understand? Well, it tells us in verses seven, eight, and nine. So verse seven says, and right at the end of verse 6, right, says, The fool cannot understand this, and you can kind of dot, 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 that though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. So the foolish and the, foolish and the uh, stupid people of the world do not understand what God understands that though the wicked seem to sprout like grass and that they're everywhere, and it seems like they flourish, seems like they get their way, seems like they're on top, that ultimately their doom is destruction forever, which is speaking of hell. And then there's, there's more. But you, verse 8, but you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. They don't understand any of that. The, the people of the world, worldly people, do not understand that. Worldly people are stupid and foolish compared to God's wisdom, which he reveals to those who he wishes. And so they don't understand that God is on high and will be on high forever. They don't understand that the foolish and the, 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 foolish and the stupid of the world don't understand that although it looks like the evildoers flourish and even though it looks like the wicked are on top in this world and that they've got it made, that ultimately they are doomed to destruction forever and that they will be scattered. And remember, this is a, what kind of a psalm? A praise praise psalm. So the psalmist is praising God for these things. And this is true. This is praiseworthy that, that God's thoughts are very deep. And compared to God, man's thoughts are not foolish, stupid in comparison to God. And that these truths are also praiseworthy. Make sense? Here, this is it's also a focus on God's thoughts here. We kind of bounce between God's works and God's thoughts, right? God's thoughts are very deep. And then it talks about God's works, how they're, the evildoers are doomed to destruction, whereas God is going to be on high forever, whereas all evildoers will be scattered and perish. Any thoughts on that? You guys are so smart. All right, question three. What do verses 10 through 11 mean? They say this. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. Let's just, uh, let's just take it verse at a time, I guess. Uh, verse 10. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. And everybody's saying, I don't have a horn. I don't have an ox. I might not even have any fresh oil at home. Does Wesson count? 
I've got a can of Pam spray. Does that count? So this is this is just speaking again. Got to remember this is a song, right? So when you listen to a song on the radio, sometimes it uses symbolism, right, to to get a point across. So this is using symbolism. So the horn is a symbol of something. What do you think the horn is a symbol of? Strength. Strength. Power. God, you've you have uh, you've brought my enemies to ruin by your power. You have exalted me. You've given me strength. You've given me power by your hand. Like that of the wild ox. He uses an example of a strong animal. You have poured over me fresh oil. Fresh oil has a symbolism as well. It would be a symbolism of blessing. So the idea is that God, you have, you have supplied my needs with strength, power, and blessing. So this is, this is the psalmist praising God for how God has allowed the psalmist to see his enemies fail. Thank you, God, you have saved me in, in more ways than one. Thank you, God, you have provided power and you have provided blessing in more ways than one. Thank you, Lord. It's, it's just a praise song. What about verse 11? My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. It's just what we just said, isn't it? This is the psalmist, again, praising God, that God allowed him. Yeah, my, God, you have let my eyes see the downfall of my enemies. That's a blessing, isn't it? Yeah. You pray to God to help you against your enemies, and then God does just that very thing and allows you to even see it. Hey, that's praiseworthy. Thank you, Lord. My eyes have seen it. My ears have heard it. The doom of my evil assailants. <laughs> Question four. <laughs> What's it saying? Hello, stuff. Question four. What are the blessings for the righteous that are given in verses 12, 13, and 14? It says this. The righteous shall flourish, flourish like the palm tree. So, and it also says that it will grow, they will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Oh, what's it? A palm tree and the cedar both are symbolic. Again, we have symbolism here. And the palm tree and the cedar are both symbolic of what? What do you think? Trees that last a really long time are, so they, they are very stable and they are very, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of permanence there. There's, there's strength there. They're there. A palm tree doesn't just grow one year and die two years later. They're there for very, very long periods of time. Cedars in Lebanon, same thing, and also known for strength. So longevity, strength. And they smell good. <laughs> and they smell good. Put them in your closet. Keep them all the way. So you get the idea that, that the righteous, so you have the wicked... They're going to they're gonna be scattered and destroyed, right? Now you have the contrast. You praise God. The, the psalmist is praising God that the wicked will be destroyed. And then he turns around and praises God that the righteous, instead of being destroyed, will flourish. And then he uses a symbolism like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. So strength, prosperity. The other thing is, is that palm trees require a lot of uh, water to survive. So they have to be in a good location. They have to be well taken care of, right, by, the, by what's around them. So the idea here is that God is providing everything for the righteous, just like a palm tree or a cedar in Lebanon. Strength, prosperity, good location, well cared for, all those things are symbolic of what the righteous have given to them by God. And the weirdest looking tree you ever did see. <laughs> Which? Which, one? Which one do you think is the weirdest? Palm tree? Uh huh. Mm, now you're looking weird. Anchor is beautiful. Has anybody ever seen the video of the. 
I know. They're just at the top. Yeah, it's like, yeah. But yeah. They, they are pretty. They are pretty. Yeah. I was just going to say, has anybody seen the video of the tree trimmer who's climbed to the top of the palm tree and he has to cut yeah. the top of it off and it's <laughs> bent over like this and he, goes, and he cuts it and it goes zoom, 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 and he goes for a ride. Like he knows it. He's all set for it. But he goes for a ride for, like it's probably a good two minutes of swaying. They had to cut the whole tree down, so he was able to cut it down safely in the area they were. He had to lop the top off first, and then you buck the pieces as you go down. And so, but yeah, he went for a, a good ride. Oh yeah, yeah, it was pretty tall. I he was. Less than see those trees. Yeah. <laughs> My old boss did, and he said they have one that you can actually drive through. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. The redwoods. The redwoods. Yeah, in California. California gas is. Seven dollars a gallon. Yeah, maybe we'll walk through the tree instead of drive through it. <laughs> Let's get to verse 13. It says this. This is, again, more blessings for the righteous, right? So it says in verse 13 that the righteous are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. What's that just telling you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's planted in, in God's temple, symbolizing that you're close to the Lord and that he's gonna, you're going to thrive. You're going to have every need met. Literally, it says, you're planted in the house of the Lord, you flourish in the courts of our God. So nearness to God is given to the righteous. Flourishing is given to the righteous. Verse 14 goes on to say, they still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. This is long, long life, blessed life, productive life. I know a lot of people that are full of sap. <laughs> the idea is like, uh, you know, uh, I, can't remember, I can't remember who it was who used this in their commentary, but somebody in some commentary somewhere used the expression fat and luxurious. Like, you know, like you're well cared for. Yeah. <laughs> you're well cared Albanians for. Albanians thought that. Like mm -hmm. if you were like overweight, that you were rich. Well, no, that was in the sure. Philippines. Sure. Yeah, the yeah. overweight Americans, they think that's because they're wealthy. Because they can afford to buy food. Yeah. You're, you're food. well off. And the idea here is that you're well off because of what God has done for you. Because you're, you're near to him. Not because of what you've done, but because of what God's done. That's why this is a song of praise towards God. It's not the psalmist saying, I have done a good job and God thanks for what you did too. That wouldn't really be a praise song, would it? This is a praise song of what God has done. And so to wrap up the last part of question four, what does it mean to be righteous? Because this is these are blessings for the righteous only, right? Not the wicked. The wicked only get destruction. But here in verses 12, 13, and 14, it talks about the blessings that are given to the righteous. So we know now what blessings are given to the righteous according to these verses. But what does it mean to be righteous? Are you talking about verse 14? I'm just talking about in the context of verses 12, 13, and 14. It says, The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit, they still bear fruit in old age and they're ever full of sap and green. And so what I'm asking is, these are the There's blessings of the right thing. That's true. They're always going to thrive. Well, so what I'm asking is, what's it mean to be righteous? In other words, who, who are the righteous? Believers. Believers. Believers in who? God. 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 Yeah. The righteous are believers in God. And how are they made? Are they, do they make themselves righteous? Or how are they considered righteous? God makes them righteous. In God's eyes. Righteous in God's eyes. Yeah. God makes them. Those are both good answers. And that's what I'm driving at, is that, again, right, this is a praise psalm, and the righteous get all these good things. So your next follow-up question is, well, who are the righteous? And then the follow-up question to that is, how do I become, how do I get in that group, right? So how do you get in the group uh, where you're considered righteous? Do a bunch of good works? Yeah. Can you be righteous and not have good works? So they come together, don't they? Yeah. The difference is, is that you have, it's not our good works that gain us righteousness. It's our good works that show God has given us his righteousness. See the difference? They, you're always going to have good works along with righteous 
goodness and righteous people. But it's not the good works that make us righteous. It's God and his work that has made us righteous. And the evidence that God has done that work in our lives and that we believe it is our good works. Make sense? Uh, <laughs> sure. Whatever, whatever. Whatever you say. <laughs> Can we move on to question five, Mark? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's an important thing. And it has to be said because a lot of times I think that that, that is not unpackaged enough. And so... If you don't know that stuff already, if someone's never unpackaged that to you, it sounds kind of self-righteous, you know? Like, my enemies are the wicked, but I'm the righteous, you know, because I do everything correctly, and I'm, I'm perfect, and I'm good. And a lot of times, that's how Christianity can come off if you don't unpackage it first. Verbiage is very important. If I, if I tell somebody, um, you know, hey, have you kept... Um, all the commandments, and I go through, I take four of the Ten Commandments, and I go through them, right? And I say, oh, you're an adulterer, a liar, and a thief. And I don't, and the whole time I'm talking, I don't mention how I too am those things. Well, how's it going to come across? It's going to come across that I'm on some soapbox, and I think that I'm high, mighty, and righteous, and you're not, and I'm just stooping down low, you know, to help you poor sucker out, that kind of thing. Instead of, no, 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 no one is righteous, no, not one. Jesus says, why do you call me good, right? Oh, good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And he's, not, he's not denying that he himself is not good. He's saying, why are you calling me good when God is only good? Are you calling me God? Because he wasn't. So that's the whole point, is that to unpackage that stuff from time to time so we make it clear. Now on to question five. What does verse 15 praise God for? To declare that the Lord is? So there's one thing. God's upright. He, yeah, that too. But let's, hold on, let's not run through this. The Lord is upright. What's that mean that the Lord's upright? What's it mean that God is upright? Oh, so in other words, uh, he, he has not fallen and can't get up. Yeah. Uh, he's in a barca lounger and he stands up. No, he's, he's sovereign. Steadfast. Sovereign, steadfast. There's a, another word I'm looking for. Well, Somebody. What's the upright? Like he, he's never... Like, done anything wrong, never like... Ah, never righteous. Yeah. Yeah. He himself is righteous. <laughs> righteous and just. So when you think of God and you, th you think his perfection, he's never done anything evil, bad, or wrong, he is literally righteousness itself, holiness itself, and justice itself. So, and that's, I think, what you're getting at, is he is that. And that is, to be upright is to be just. To be upright is to be holy. To be upright is to be righteous and all those things. And not only is he all those things, he is the source of all those things. Like he, he's not, that's not just a little bit of his character. That is exactly who he is. And he is the source of all those things. So we know that that's one of the things that God's being praised for in verse 15, to declare that the Lord is upright. And now, Elizabeth, that he is my rock. rock. What, what, when you think of a rock, what is a rock? He's smooth. He's hard. Oh, strong. Um, what else do you think of when you think of rocks? Indestructible. Indestructible. I like Big. that. Big. Uh, a rock, if you think of a really, really, really big rock that's immovable, a word that also means, um, well, he's consistent is the word I'm going to try and get to. He's very consistent. Thank you. <laughs> he's very consistent. He's a rock. He doesn't move. He doesn't change. He's a rock. The Lord is my rock and my refuge. My, a rock is, a, is symbolic of God and uses a symbol for God all the time. You know? Meaning his strength, his consistency, he's immovable. You hear the term immutable means he does not change. Just like how a big rock stuck in the ground does not move. It does not change. Well, neither does God. That's the idea here. It's a symbolic of his faithfulness again. His power is immovable. What else does it say? He is my rock, and there is what? There is no what in him. No unrighteous in him. That goes right back to what Tiff said. You know, there's, he's never done anything wrong. There's no evil in him. There's no unrighteousness in him. There's no injustice in him. He, he is perfectly holy, perfectly good. That's why the angels never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is not just holy, not just holy, holy, holy. 
He is holy, 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 ad finitum. Just on and on and on forever. He is perfectly holy. And he is good. <laughs> that was that was quick. <coughs> Okay, but first I want to finish with one last question that I, that I thought, I don't know if it's on your copies or not. Do you guys have a question six? No. All right, I was probably thinking that I wasn't sure if we'd have time for it or not. So question six is this. The subtitle of Psalm 92 says, How great are your works, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath. All right, so what is the Sabbath? And how does it fit into a believer's life today? Because there's two parts to this question, isn't there? There's Sabbath, and then there's Sabbath. There's Old Testament Sabbath and New Testament Sabbath. There's, there's the Israelites' Mosaic Law Sabbath, and then, and then there's yeah. Sabbath. Day Adventist celebrating her and after time. Yes, so we're going to unpackage all that so that everybody can be on the same page. So, but first off, what it, when I say Sabbath, let me focus that in a little bit more. What is the Sabbath according to Mosaic law or according to the, the Old Testament Israelites? How did they view the Sabbath? What was the Sabbath? Saturday. Saturday? No work. They didn't do no it. Work. No work. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, what's that? Is that, that, it? Is that correct? Yeah. Well, there's more to it than that. So the first, say, the first, they make their offering? there's a lot going on with it. So let me unpackage it that way first. So, yeah. I was going to say, does it have something to do about um, they Appre appreciating God's creation? Yes. Ultimately, yes. And that's why I'm going to lead you to... Gen uh, well, the first time you hear it mentioned at all is all the way back in Genesis, right? When God is making all of creation, and he finishes making all creation on the sixth day, and he says, this is good. And he rests on the seventh day. He rests from his creation on the seventh day. He does nothing. He does nothing. Now you'll notice all the way back in Genesis that it mentions nothing about this is the day you worship. It mentions nothing about anything else. It just mentions that that is the day that God marked. He says, sanctify this day. In other words, set that day apart. Right? And keep it holy. And the idea is for what Kathy was mentioning that all the way back in Genesis, the very first mention of the word Sabbath is referring to the seventh day that God marked for rest and as a remembrance of his perfection, of his creation, and his role as creator. Okay, So all the way back in Genesis, the very first time Sabbath is mentioned, there is no additional talk of make the sacrifice on that day, sing the songs on that day, worship me on that day. None of that is mentioned right? None of that's mentioned. That doesn't come along until you get to the Israelites. When the Israelites are given the Mosaic law, that is when that comes along. Now, the Mosaic law, does that apply to believers today? Yes or no? No. No. It applied to the Israelites. And the reason it applied to the Israelites was that they were, it was meant to keep them apart, to sanctify and set them apart from all other people. And because God was using them as a foreshadowing of the people that he would save for himself, from himself, by himself. So all the things that come into the Mosaic Law that are ceremonial are all specifically just for the Israelites and just for the Old Testament time. They all were part and shadow pointing to Christ and pointing to a time to come. Now... Now we have this transitional time. Jesus comes. And so you have Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all the foreshadowing that all this Mosaic law was meant to do. And it's like this example I've given before, that you have uh, concert posters. And the concert poster says, hey, coming up, you know, this concert is coming. This is when it's going to happen. This is who's going to be here, right? And that poster, you need it until the concert's over. Because once the concert's over, that poster's useless, the only purpose of the poster was to point to the coming of the event. Once the event happens, the poster is useless. It's the same with the Mosaic ceremonial laws. Ten Commandments are moral laws. And so those laws are still in effect. 
But ceremonial laws were no longer necessary. That's why you don't need sacrifices anymore, right? Because Christ has already done all this. He's made the perfect sacrifice. Everything that was meant to foreshadow Jesus Christ has been accomplished in and through Jesus Christ. So now we have this transitionary time where now the Sabbath means something different, doesn't it? Because the Sabbath is a Saturday to the Jews. But, and we celebrate and worship on Sunday because that's when Christ resurrected. But that's the first day of the week. Saturday is the end of the week. So all that to say, how does it fit into the life of a believer today then? Do you need to keep the Sabbath? And what does it mean to keep the Sabbath? Because somebody could think that it means I gotta keep Mosaic law and I gotta worship on Saturday. And, I, and then all that stuff that was added, the ceremonies, all the rituals, all the particular things you had to do, some of that was Mosaic law, some of that was added in by men, which is what the Pharisees were throwing at Jesus and his disciples. Hey, you're picking off heads of wheat as you're walking through the fields. You're working on the Sabbath. And God never said you couldn't do that. Even in Old Testament you know, Mosaic law, you could still do that. Never said, or healing. Jesus would flaunt it in their face and heal on the Sabbath to show that he has power over the Sabbath and also to show that it's not man-made rules. Uh, as he says, God made the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. So how does it fit into the life of a believer today then when we say, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, fourth commandment? It's just our salvation. It's your salvation. It's like when we live. It ties into what we were talking about at the very beginning, right? That Psalm 92 is a praising of God for our salvation and his creation. So it's, it's all of that. And that's why it's a song for the Sabbath. Because it talks about what you said in salvation and what you said earlier about creation. It's a praising of God for both. So when we remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, what you're really remembering is that God is holy. He's the creator of all things. And that he had earth perfect and it was lost because of sin and now god has made a way for salvation and so it ties in all that together so that's how today a believer remembers the sabbath and keeps it holy not by following a particular ritual not by worshiping on a particular day or any of those things and quite honestly you're you're meant to worship the lord every day right you're meant to acknowledge him every day. The idea of remembering the Sabbath and keep it holy is to, like, you know how you don't keep the Sabbath holy? Uh, God didn't create the earth. That's, that's breaking the fourth commandment. Or, uh, you know, God needed billions of years to do it. That's breaking the fourth commandment. You're not keeping the Sabbath and all that it represents and signifies as holy, both his salvation and his creation. Um, case in point. Colossians 2.16, which we just went over. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or in regard to festival, new moon, or Sabbath. Uh, Romans 14, verse 5. One person esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. It's talking about the conscience. So if your conscience says, um, you know, I just am not comfortable eating um, bats. You know, feel like I feel like it's a I feel like it's an affront to God, and so your conscience just burns every time you eat a bat. Well, then you shouldn't eat bats. Okay, that's the point. That that all of Romans fourteen is talking about the conscience. So you, your God given conscience is is there for a reason. So you don't go against your conscience on matters of freedom, right? You can eat a bat or you don't have to eat a bat, right? You can do either one. Neither one's sinful. But if you believe it is sinful to eat a bat and you eat a bat, guess what? It's sinful. That's the point. If you believe that, that, you, that you have to worship on Saturday at 7 p.m. and you don't do it and you think that's sin, then it is sin. Because you believe it in your own mind. You are convinced in your own mind and yet you still do it not. Then that is sin, a sin of conscience. So that makes sense. That frees people from the whole Sabbath debate. You brought up the Seventh-day Adventists who... They're, that's one of their main tenets is that you must and it's turned into a work where you know you must worship on saturday and that is that is that is burned into their beliefs it's a cult it really is especially the way that they view um 
Ellen G. White and view her as a mouthpiece of God and that everything that her writings are on equal par with the Bible. And let me tell you, you want some interesting reading. Very heavy into uh, saying that God spoke to her, very heavy into health. Uh, you got to eat a very certain diet, that kind of stuff. Her name's Ellen. Yeah, Ellen G. White. Just look up Seven Day Adventism. You yeah. cannot miss it. That will certainly be part of it. So, any thoughts or questions about Sabbath or anything else like that? You explained that very well. Well, thank you. It's you know what's funny is that's one of the things that does not get explained very often at all in most churches. And so you have people out there with a very hodgepodge kind of uh, throw everything in but the kitchen sink approach to what the Sabbath means. And so there's all this confusion. And even the confusion of, well, what is the Sabbath, right? And so you have to break it down that way so that you understand why there's that confusion because there are several different ways of answering that question. So you've got to have all the parts on the, all the players on the table so that you can explain what each player's role is, and now you can understand how it applies to us today. That's think, why we still have the fourth commandment. Keeping the Sabbath holy, if it's just a ritual we do every week. Mm -hmm. Oh, today we got to go to church. Well, there's right. more to it than church. Yeah, motive is there. Motive. You know, motive of the heart. So that when, when you remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, it's tied into the other commandments in your relationship with God. Do not take his name in vain. Uh, do not have any other gods before him. Do not have any graven images, right? These are all relational to God. And so the fourth commandment, talking about the Sabbath day and keeping it holy, is also our relationship to God as acknowledgement as him as creator and also acknowledgement as him as, as savior because of the loss of perfection that he had made that perfect earth and perfect everything. Sin came into it and ruined everything because of our sin. And so now he's made another way to bring everything back to perfection again. And that's and then so the motive of the heart when you worship, instead of God doesn't want hypocritical worship. God doesn't want people to just follow rules and say, oh, well, I want you to come. You need to come to church every Sunday. And God, God would rather have somebody to come to church twice a month but come fully convinced in their own minds with the right motives then somebody show up every single Sunday to both services, but it's just a show. It's just a going through the motions. Like, that's not really worship at all. And if you think about it, that's, that's, that's what Satan does. Satan refuses to worship God. Even if you're in his house, and even if you're singing songs to him, if your heart is not worshiping him, if you're not worshiping him on the inside, then you're not really worshiping him. You're actually rebelling against him and having the gall to do it in his house. Think about that. He, he, 